Are you the expert that's always brought in when a certain module or component is broken? When this thing is broken, it's always you who needs to fix it. This keeps you the forever owner of this thing. And maybe you start to resent this thing for it. Maybe you would like to share ownership of this thing with your team members. How do you start sharing ownership of such a thing? Right now, you're the only one who knows. Right now, you're probably 10 times as fast as the next person when you have to do work on this. So I can see why it's very difficult to get out of such a situation where you are the only one owning a certain piece of code. But you have to get out of it because this is not sustainable. You can't own this thing alone forever. Code ownership is the idea of having certain parts of the code, like classes, modules, or entire services, assigned to a specific person. That person is the only one who makes changes. The opposite is called collective code ownership or shared code. What do you think would happen if you were to be in such a team that has strong code ownership? You would slowly start to get more and more specialized on the thing that you own by yourself. And you would be less knowledgeable and get less experience in the things that are outside of the thing you're responsible for. So effectively, you're going to drift apart from your team members. Code ownership is an old ID. It's considered an anti-pattern right now. It's a bad idea. Let me explain why. The first reason is that companies organize around teams, not individuals. The moment you would leave the company, there's a problem because you're the only one who could do that job. In addition, individuals don't scale. If the company for a strategic reason has decided it needs to speed up this kind of work you're doing, it needs to go three times as fast. What are you gonna do, work harder? No, at that point, you would have to scale yourself anyway. You would need to start to work together with other people. Otherwise, you're going to burn out. That's not sustainable. It's very risky for a company to have individuals all responsible for their own thing. It's risky and it doesn't scale. And the second reason is that code changes often span multiple components. If you have separate people owning these components, you would suddenly have the overhead of communicating with them about their things. And it's not a collaboration, this is almost a negotiation communication. It's as a service communication. This person needs to do something for you because they are owning this. They are the best person to make that kind of change. This creates overhead and therefore it slows you down. And thirdly, maybe the most important reason, is that the moment you're all responsible for a small part, human psychology makes it really hard to feel responsible for the whole thing. It makes it really hard to deliver value to paying customers and to users and to not lose sight of the big picture. The moment you're responsible for a small part, it's really easy to get into the mindset of, this is my job, I'm done, the rest is yours. Many of the responsibilities fall into the cracks in between the responsibilities. This is where you lose quality. Your job isn't done until the job is done. And code ownership is the opposite of that mindset. Now, many teams nowadays don't follow strong code ownership by design, but many teams do have accidental code ownership. Some parts are just more owned by other people. And not all of it is bad, some, some is okay, but if there's just one person that always needs to make this change, there's a sign of a problem there. So how do we get out of this situation? How do we improve shared code ownership? In two steps, skill mapping and pair programming. I'll talk about them both. Let's talk about skill mapping first. Skill mapping is the act of identifying what skills every team member has and to what degree. It can be a retrospective activity, but it doesn't have to be. And it's not unique to software engineering. It's also done in UX departments or in HR departments. It's a general thing. Now in this, skill can mean multiple things. I think of it as an area of expertise. A few examples are your programming language. If you are in an environment with multiple programming language where this is relevant, then your programming language can be a skill. It could be a library or a framework, especially if you have multiple of them. It could be how well you know a certain software component, a certain module, a certain class. It could be, it could be functions, it could be services. Or if you're working in a cross-functional team with multiple front-end developers and back-end developers, a skill could be the BFF, the backend for frontend service, or the database, or the data structures itself. It could also be features or capabilities spread across multiple software components. For example, authentication. Some person might own authentication, both the server part, the HTTP cookie part and the front end part. Logging is another example. If you have a microservice landscape and you use the same logging library and it is also being written in this Kubernetes context to this specific service that handles logging that is spread across multiple services, you might own that kind of topic. It's really anything that is big enough to 
take some time to get into. It's anything that requires some kind of onboarding that is, is probably owned by one or more people that is it's worth talking about as a team. Skill mapping is quite a natural activity. It's just figuring out who's good at what. And when I searched for it, it turned out to already exist. It's, it's done in many disciplines. It's also known as a skill matrix or a competency map. To get started with skill mapping, think of a table. Let's build one together. You have the names of your team members on the horizontal axis and you have the skills, the software components, the features on the vertical axis. And at that point, it's filling in the table. You need to decide what level of granularity you want. Do you want only yes, no, or a Boolean in the cells? Or do you want more granularity, like low, mid, high? Or do you want even numbers one to five? Now, these skills are often not that measurable. So I would recommend to just get started with two or three levels of granularity. Just put low, mid, high there. But you could add a check mark to each cell that says, I'm interested to learn this skill. This might be useful information for the team to know. And this is what it could look like if you would do the exercise as a team. You can already get quite a bit of information from what you see here. There is somebody who might be more of a senior or not a senior at all, but very long with the project. There's somebody who just joined or is very junior. Either is okay. It's just good that you now have this information as to where this person is most or least comfortable. You might have somebody who's more focused on the back end, somebody who's more focused on the front end. But the question is here, where are the potential problems? If you look at this data, what skills do you think are potentially problematic? I think this one, networking cookies, because Janessa is the only one who has a high and the rest has a low. So this person is probably owning this skill completely alone. That, that may be a problem. It may also not be a problem, but I think in this, in this case, it's a problem. There's other things here, the UI data layer, uh, MobX, only owned by this person. There's more mid levels here. Uh, the HTML CSS only by this person. I'm, I'm not sure this is a problem, but it, it could be a problem. And the thing is, you as a team are the only people who can decide whether it is a problem or not. Maybe these mids are, are, are good enough. Maybe this person likes doing this work a lot that it makes sense to stay in this situation, but maybe it doesn't. You have to think of the risk for the company and you have to think of sharing the code as much as possible, but don't overdo it. Every, it's not the case that everybody has to be an expert at everything. It's not the goal that this entire field of things is green and everybody is high on everything. That's not the goal. The purpose is to identify potential problems and start slowly solving them. If there are very little gaps or if the gaps you're looking at are not really a problem for the company, then okay, sure, you're doing all right. Maybe you don't have to change anything in how you're working right now. Now, making this requires honesty and vulnerability, and it can be scary. It can be difficult to do this. In one of my other videos, I talked about how fear and ego can be in the way of your growth. It applies here to remember that failing is learning. There's one gotcha though. If you don't feel safe around your manager, make sure the manager is not included in this meeting. Make sure this is not being seen by the manager. If you're afraid that you rate yourself low, you're gonna get a bad assessment or even worse, you're gonna get fired, then keep it in the team. That is really, it's okay to do. And make sure you delete the artifact. In fact, I think this as a conversation starter is very valuable, but as an artifact itself, it's pretty worthless. It's good to gain some insights from it, but I would recommend you delete it pretty quickly because it will get out of date really soon, both in terms of your own skills and in terms of the, the components that, that are there and team member switch and whatnot. So I would just get the insights from it and, and get rid of it. Now, whether you have loads of code ownership by design or you have some accidental code ownership, I really recommend this activity. It's the right thing to do for yourself, for your team and for your company. Now, let's assume you've done the activity. What's next? How do you improve the situation? Part three, pair programming. Now that you've done this activity, you have shared visibility as a group on where everybody's skills and aspirations lie. You know where you have a problem. You know where the skill is low, or if you have one person owning one or multiple components, you can say, I, we have a problem as a team and we need to solve this problem. The best way to transfer knowledge and create shared code ownership is pair programming. So I recommend to, now that you've identified these gaps, pick the top three and start pair programming on those topics from now on. 
mandatory pair programming to close the gap. So next time you have work for the team on one of those topics, make sure you assign both one learner and one expert to pair program the whole thing together. The alternative is that you make the learner do it alone, but it's no fun and it's very inefficient. It will take a lot of time. So it's it's not, why, not a wise decision for the company probably, but at least make sure you don't end up with the worst case scenario, which is the expert doing it alone again. That keeps you stuck in the current situation. It's not sustainable to do. To summarize, code ownership is bad, shared code ownership is good. It's a good idea to start identifying the gaps. Where did code ownership accidentally sneak into your team? I've shown skill mapping as a way to identify those gaps. There's other ways you can think of as well, but whatever you do, set rules around pair programming. Start pair programming to slowly start solving the problem. A few weeks or months from now, the problem will be gone. And that's it. I hope you liked it. I hope this was helpful. If you have any thoughts or if you have an idea for a future video, please let me know in the comments and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching.